do I do it? How do I make it all? How do I still have my career? At that moment, I really started to question, is this balance thing like really real? For whatever reason, society has told us that when we step away from the workplace, we are somehow less valuable. Yeah. It's not the case in any way, shape or form. Hello and welcome to Happy Mum, Happy Baby, Parenting SOS. Now, I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking that it can sometimes be daunting trying to find support and advice around certain parenting topics. There is so much information out there. Sometimes it's conflicting. And this is especially true, I think, for what we're talking about today. Navigating life as a working mum. From negotiating maternity leave to returning to work with confidence from mum guilt to budgeting for childcare, there's so much to get your head around. Well, luckily, my guest today is someone who has collated all of this information and put it into one place. It's the founder of My Bump Pay, working mum, Toby Azare. Oh, thank you. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Oh, what a pleasure. We should also include that you're not only a working mum, but you've also had time to write a book. Somehow. I don't know. It feels like a blink of an eye that it happened in. Really? <laughs> yeah, even though, obviously, you know, it's quite it's quite a process to write a yeah. book. But it just feels like it, obviously, it didn't just happen, but it just feels like a big part of my life that just kind of passed me by. I think I was so engrossed in the process of just getting it, getting it done and making yeah. it really good. Um, but I'm really really proud of it well it all started from my bump pay so how did how did that come about what made you decide to focus your attention on 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 creating it yeah like many things from personal experience so I was the first person in my office location um as part of a multinational organization to go on maternity leave and at that point in that office location yes yeah at that point in time I felt I am so ferociously ambitious. I've got things that I really want to make sure that I achieve for myself and my wider family, but also I really want to have a family. Yeah. And so I don't see why any of these things should stop me from doing one or the other. Anyway, I went on this journey and there were lots of questions that kind of came to me and the practical questions were answered, but really the fundamental question to me was like, how do I do it? How do I make it all? How do I still have my career and have my family all at the same time, like, is it possible? Um, but also at that time, given that I was the first person, there wasn't really necessarily the maternity pay policy that I would have expected from right. an organisation of that of that size. Yeah, I had statutory at the time, maternity pay. That was that was the policy. So I went on this journey to be like, excuse me, <laughs> can we have a conversation about this maternity pay? Please, as I went on that journey and started to really educate myself, I thought, wow, there is so much that I'm learning here. So I started largely around the topic of money, hence the name, my bump pay. But also, that's <laughs> such a difficult... I think we're really rubbish in the UK about talking about money. Yeah. It's something that makes us go, oh, you know, we don't like talking about it anyway. So when someone's going, OK, you to get statutory, you're like, yep, 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 fine, boop, boop, boop. You know, yeah. it takes a lot of courage or bravery or just kind of... Or is it simply self-worth? Is it that kind of going, no, this is what, actually what I'm owed? I think it's a bit of like, I'm not going to be the first. Well, I am the first. I'm not going to be the last yeah. person. He wants to start a family for this organisation. So if you are really thinking about attracting the best talent and building a sustainable workforce within this company, then you should start thinking about this. And I, yeah. I think it was something that they had thought about, but I think nobody brought that issue to them properly in, until then. So there I was with my stomach saying, you know, right, let's going to have this conversation. Um, and I'm really pleased that we were able to get a policy in place. Yeah. Uh, it must have changed now because I don't work at that organisation. Also, that, that meant that you helped create that yeah, policy. absolutely, which I feel really proud of. Yeah. Again. <laughs> and how has it evolved over time? Yeah, so it's, initially it started about money. Mm-hmm. And then lots of people asking the question, as I had the same question, like, okay, right, we kind of were starting to understand this money side of it, but how do you really make it work? Like, how do you do pick up and drop off? Yeah. Like, how do you find a good nursery that works for your family setup? Or is it a childminder? Is it a nanny? Like, what do what do I need? What do I make my partner do? Do they Does my partner do shared parental leave? Or is that not worth our time? And all of these questions just evolved so I started to answer more and more of those questions and then um, I started doing master classes which is effectively getting a group of women together and it's one of my favorite things to do getting a group of women together who are either just about to go on maternity leave maybe even thinking about it maybe even haven't you know started actually going down that road of having a family and then a group of women who have recently returned and started to unpack these topics and kind of really swap the almost like the 
I wouldn't call them the secret skills, but yeah. like, this is how we can do it, guys. Started through those masterclasses. Um, and then somewhere down the line, very fortuitously, I was um, approached by a publisher <laughs> <laughs> to say, have you ever thought of writing a book? My immediate response was, absolutely no way. <laughs> really? Where am I going to find the time? I yeah. just started a new job. I think my youngest was one at the time. My eldest was three. Um, and I changed industries as well with this new job. And I thought, it's just impossible. Yeah. Um, but I spoke to a dear friend of mine. Um, her name is Deja Ayadele, Um, And she said, just, just go for it. At least you're documenting your knowledge. You're documenting your craft. Like, you've got a lot to offer. So just mm-hmm. go for it. Um, and so I did. So it's evolved now into a book. And I think a platform really where fundamentally at the heart of it is that whatever you want to be, <laughs> whatever you want to achieve, irrespective of your life stage, yeah. or irrespective of any characteristics you hold, you absolutely go out there and do the very best that you can and know that you tried mm-hmm. and know that you've given it your all and know that you haven't let life circumstances or life stage stop you. Yeah. Now, I talk a lot about the juggle or finding a balance, but you call it the blend. Yeah. So tell me what is the blend? Oh, I love the blend. Um, I can't take credit for it, actually. It's my amazing editor who, as I was writing, I'd refer to the blend in the book. And she's like, why not just call it the blend? And I was like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> it's been staring at me, the title. Um, so I like to think of it a bit like this in the sense that if you kind of look at our lives and our careers, everyone talks a lot about kind of work-life balance and finding that work-life balance. But I remember running through Waterloo Station. I don't know how well you know Waterloo Station. I know, it, it's big. It's a very long yeah. course. And I was running and I was running late. And at that moment, I was like, oh, I'm not doing this very well, am I? I can't get to pick up on time. I don't feel like I'm really nailing it in my job. Like, where is this balance that everybody has promised me? Mm-hmm. Like, does it exist? I literally had, like, makeup tiered stains, like, rolling down my eye, like my, my face into, like, my scarf. And it's at that moment, I really started to question is this balance thing like really real? And I thought about it and I thought, actually, our parenting lives and lives of parents are like really messy. It's really quite hard to put in a box that weighs exactly the same as what you have on the other side, which may be your career and other mm. life stuff that you have going on. It's just really, really messy. And I started to think about it, right, why don't I, in every single stage and season, just take a blend of different things that I need or need to focus on so for example if you know my my youngest starts school in September oh my goodness I can't (laughs) believe it you know at that particular stage my priority or a bulk of my energy is going to go into making sure that she's settled and that she's comfortable and that she's confident and therefore I'm going to take a blend of different things that I need to make sure that that is the priority at that particular you know point in time yeah you know at the point when I started the new job actually me kind of getting settled into that new job again was really important so it was like right husband you're going to have to do more than your 50%, which he's really willing to do. And so you take a blend of different elements that you need at different times. It's just like baking or cooking. Yeah, like we were talking about yeah, cooking, yeah. right? So, yeah, if you want a bit more garlic, you add a bit more garlic to create the balance of flavours that you want in that particular dish. And versus, you know, vice versa, if you're making a slightly different dish or for slightly someone with slightly different taste, you might add less garlic. So yeah. I think it's a lot more forgiving it's a lot more, um, it allows you to have a lot more compassion for mm-hmm. yourself, but also within the blend, it's something that I wish I'd actually written more about. I do write about it, but you can start to put boundaries along the, you know, this is what I need here, but this is where this stops. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then communicating your boundaries to the people that are around you. So be it, you know, work, family, your partner, your friends, etc. So I think it's a term that allows you to take what you need at various different stages of your life. Um, and I, don't get me wrong, like juggle still is in the back of my mind. <laughs> um, but I think juggle feels quite frenetic and sometimes it yeah. can feel frenetic. The way I like to think about juggle is that you've got different, and I think this is not my um, phrase at all, but you often are juggling things and there are plastic balls, which yeah. is fine for them to drop. Yeah. And they're glass balls, you know, in that particular season you need to keep keep up in the air my plastic balls for example are very often laundry (laughs) my husband hates it (laughs) he hates that I let the laundry slide but that for me is that that might be my thing in a really busy season that it gets done a bit later yeah yeah what like doing the work that you do what have you found are the biggest challenges that that mums working mums face where do you start I think confidence is such a big 
big, big challenge. There's been lots of data and studies that show that actually postpartum, your confidence can dip up to two years and sometimes it can go on a little bit longer. Um, I know it's something that I've definitely struggled with and still do to this day. <laughs> Even this morning, I was listening to the chapter of, you know, of confidence from my own audiobook. Really? <laughs> you know, to get me in the zone for everything that I knew that I had yeah. to face today. It's a real challenge, I think, for so many reasons. For whatever reason, society has told us that when we step away from the workplace, we are somehow less valuable. Yeah. It's not the case in any way, shape or form. Mm. And I think sometimes we put pressure on ourselves to show up as the same individual as we were when maybe we took a step away from that particular career to start a family. Yeah. We change, we evolve. I actually think we get better. <laughs> well, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because I feel like years ago when someone left to become a mum, they maybe came back and, and maybe they were viewed a bit differently. But actually, or maybe it's because I am a mum now, but you see that actually how much more you bring with you when you come that's back. Insane. And also, so I watched um, Jessica Ennis-Hill gave an amazing chat once I was I was there to see. And she was like, your your time is precious. Yeah. So you've got to make that time count. Absolutely. So you give that person a job, give that working mum a job and she'll absolutely oh, get it done. She'll get it done. And she'll be really efficient with it and, you know, everything else. And we're so intuitive as well. Yeah. I actually read um, a lady called Zoe Blasky, who's amazing yes, as well. Yes, I love well. her, yeah. Um, and she was. She wrote a post about actually we're so much better at spotting things like mm. maybe in the workplace our emotional intelligence heightened so things like that and there's an exercise in the master classes that I love that I get people to do so the first thing is like write down three career things that you're really proud of the second thing is write down three things about your maternity leave for example that you are really proud of and then write down three things in general maybe about your family life or any other thing that you're really proud of and the stories that these women tell and the power in actually having these women read these things out. My, my, it's literally the point where I'm just like, hold the tears back, hold the tears <laughs> back because I'm running this masterclass. It's phenomenal. Some women are like, do you know what? Actually, I had a, a, you know, a really sick child and I had to navigate that and, you know, learning everything that came with that and managing my family and managing my household and I went back to work and I got a promotion mm. or, do you know, I, I mastered breastfeeding or um, I gained new friends and I made new friends and I made a new community. Like, all of those things take real courage. Yeah. They take, they take real, like, oomph and skills to make happen, like, even if you are on maternity leave or parental leave. And then not to mention everything that you were doing in your career beforehand, all of those things don't go away. It's just mm. like riding a bike. You may be a bit be a bit rusty but when you get going you're like I've got this I remember how to do this yeah and that's exactly what I think you know parental leave can be we don't lose those skills they they get better we get better do you think there is an element of I mean you know talking about blend and and that juggle when you are a working mum and you do step back in there's a different financial aspect because you've got to sort out childcare yeah. there's a different mental load because you're no longer just thinking about you getting to the office or where you might be going afterwards for drinks you know you've got the other stuff that's going on yeah. there's there's so many different pieces of the the puzzle at that point to to bring together yeah yeah there's a lot going on isn't there <laughs> so much <laughs> there's a lot it's really interesting when men have read the book the blend yeah and they've walked away thinking, oh, my goodness, I need to do more. So men that maybe are in a partnership or are a parent, they actually realise there's a lot that, that is placed on the woman's shoulders, yeah. responsibility, whether, you know, implicitly or explicitly. So, yes, there definitely is a lot to kind of juggle. And I say to that, especially when it come, kind of comes to your career, I think there's a lot of pressure on us as women. I know I feel it all the time to feel like we've got to go and give like 150% because we know that we're rushing off a pickup or we know that we're, yeah. you know, there's lots of different things going on. And to that, I would say, take the pressure off yourself. If you've got a really good leader, boss, team, every quarter, like really think about what are the priorities and agree those priorities together. So, right, if you focus on those priorities, amazing. And everything else on that list can wait until yeah. it's that season for those things to be a priority. So I think it's, you know, a constant re-evaluation of what is important in this season. Great, let's focus on those things. If it's not important, let's not do those things. Mm -hmm. Also, if you if you can, get help. So sometimes that's from friends, sometimes that's yeah. from your village, That's sometimes that's your built village, sometimes that's your bought village. It, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I think doing parenting alone can be really hard. Also, I think, you know, like you say about the bought village, 
really now, not many of us are bringing up children in the way that our parents would have done with aunts and uncles or grandparents nearby. Like that's just not yeah. a dumb thing. And I think it's such a shame though that there's still much, still so much stigma and, and shame and guilt attached to having to buy your religion. We're not super women, so I don't understand how, how do we're going to do all we're these getting things. it all done. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's impossible. It's yeah. absolutely impossible. And look, I, I absolutely appreciate that. It, it is absolutely a privilege, and mm-hmm. not, we're not all in that position where we can buy help in. But have a chat with your company. There may be schemes and different things that they do that can actually help with that kind of, you know, yeah. financial contribution. For example, I, I work for an amazing organization, and one of the things that they offer is. Um, bubble childcare which is the app where you can oh, kind yeah. of book and there's a particular amount of money off that you get if you kind of book through the platform through work for example so sometimes it's just asking the question here there mm-hmm. and, or it could even be swaps with friends yeah. for example so it could be friends that say right okay right, I, I'll take your kids this weekend and you can have mine that weekend etc so yeah if there is help out there paid or non-paid don't be afraid to say yes to it do you feel like when it comes to policies and things like that that it's weirdly something that people don't aren't really aware of until they are in the position where they're expecting a baby i do definitely encourage people that you know if you think maybe you might want a child in the future go and read that policy because now more and more and more which is amazing that we're starting to see those policies encompass so many things they they encompass you know adoption leave like what does that Mm -hmm. process look like ivf some companies even contribute towards ivf you know, they document things around kind of menopause policies yeah. as well. There is so much now in more progressive companies. That's so good. Right. On Parenting SOS, I ask you to bring in your most asked yes. questions. The first one is how do I find my confidence going back to work? This is a really big one. I feel mm. like when you've had a baby, you're such a different human to what you were before. Like it feels like it. I can remember going into um my manager's office after six weeks six weeks after having my second just feeling like whoa this feels so weird like I feel like I'm not you know first of all it was far too soon I wasn't ready I shouldn't yeah, you know yeah. I just thought I was just showing off my baby but you know realizing actually it was like my world's colliding in a way and it was a massive confidence knock yeah it's really hard and I like I said I've definitely experienced it and I've I hate that word imposter syndrome, but I've definitely experienced that. And I would say that my imposter syndrome had imposter syndrome. <laughs> like I didn't want anyone to know that I had imposter syndrome. Um, but one exercise that I really, really encourage people to do is carve out a bit of time and actually take your job description or your or your role specification and actually start to break it down. And it could be, for example, I'm really like simplifying it here. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe your job is to hire an X, X number of people within a year. So maybe that's your job, for example. And then actually look back and look at all the times that you did that and write it down next to that line item. You can get really like tactical with this. You can get it into an Excel spreadsheet and all sorts. As you start to do that line by line by line by line by line, you start to realise that actually that was that was me that did mm. that. I did all of those things. Yes, I've had a baby. Yes, you know, I've definitely experienced that change. But that person hasn't necessarily kind of gone away so that's one thing I encourage people to get really practical really tangible second thing could be to maybe find a mentor maybe somebody could be in your organization or outside of your organization that has returned back to work Uh and often you can just ask those questions that you might not feel so confident asking kind of like in the workplace so I think mentors are like amazing and wonderful human beings some organizations actually offer access to return coaching or return Mm, programs so that might be another question to ask there's like heaps of tips um in the book as well and I also I talk about investing yourself because it's so important like nobody's going to invest in yourself in the same way that you can so maybe get a book listen to podcasts go for a walk Mm. and get all of that kind of really good confidence building information inside of you and then lastly if you do have like a workplace ERG which is maybe a group of people that have gone through similar experiences so we have workers parents and carers for example right just even joining one of those groups you'll feel less alone even just from from talking about it and it it can be quite hard to be honest about it. You will realise you are not alone Mm. and the large majority of people who have gone through that transition phase 
feel like that. So it makes you feel like, actually, it's less about me. It's more a process that I need to work through. Um, Another question. How to navigate mum guilt as a working parent? Mum guilt is so huge. Mm. It's so huge. You know, and it doesn't actually add anything, any value to our lives. Oh, my gosh. None at all. And it's really interesting. Um, Anna Matha, who oh, there's so many amazing people, yeah, kind of, people yeah. you know, write on this particular topic. And she was talking about that actually there are some kinds of guilt that are actually quite helpful because they make us stop and think, right, am I doing too much? What are the checks yeah. and balances I need to put in place? The majority of guilt is put on us by society mm-hmm. in the sense that actually you know, who told us this image of kind of this Mary Poppins, and I write about this in the book, this Mary Poppins image of motherhood where, you know, you've got everything perfectly sorted and you're just kind of tra la 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 you know, trotting along with all your children <laughs> and everyone's cleanly dressed. And, that, and smiling. And smiling. <laughs> that doesn't exist. Yeah. It doesn't exist. And that mother that, you know, is with their children 24-7, again, that doesn't exist because mm-hmm. you need to rest, you need to sleep. It's so important. So actually defining what makes a good mum yeah. is truly personal to you and I think we all need to do the work and actually really you know I thought I'd be really um maternal and doting and obviously I love my children to bits but equally I've discovered what makes me a good mum is sometimes getting out the door and going to work and coming back like sometimes that is what fills my cup yeah other times on the weekend it's like taking them along to all of that their activities. I I need a healthy dose of both (laughs) to be a good mum. That's why I love the the title of this podcast because it is Happy Mum, Happy Baby. It's so true. So I think with mum guilt, get really honest with yourself about, Mm -hmm. right, okay, there's that definition of a good mum. Is that really my definition of a good mum? And therefore create your own definition of good mum. And then I get really practical with my mum guilt. So I have these little Polaroids that I've... um, pulled out from like pictures of Pinterest I've got like Michelle Obama for example because I just think she's an absolute boss um I've got things like a family holiday like pictures of family yeah. holiday I've got things like pictures of like a lovely kitchen and stuff like that and I remind myself in the moments where I can't be there for my children because I am working or there is something happening actually that's what I'm building towards that's what I'm contributing towards I play a really important role in their lives whether I'm physically there or not. Mm -hmm. So those moments where I get a bit wobbly, I'm like, actually, do you know what? I'm still doing the hard work. I'm still doing the meaningful work. They feel loved. And that's the most important things. Um, And I think in this season as well, where, well, I've got a child in school and I always feel like I'm never quite at school enough and never quite at work enough. (laughs) Um, And there are things I I can't get to all of those things at school. Um, and so sometimes... Well, so I, when, like, at certain times in the year as well, it feels like never-ending. It's quite intense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels like, <laughs> please come in for this, please come in for this, you'll be at two for this. No, I can't be there at two. I'm yeah. working. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly that. And then I get all the dates kind of muddled. And I remember, oh, I could, I could tell many a story. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes it's, you know, I do talk to my son who's a little bit older and I say, look, I can't come to everything. Like, what are the things you really want me to come to? Yeah. And then he'll say, okay, I really want you to come to that. I really want, and the list is long, but I yeah. try and kind of work with him so that he starts to starts to understand. Um, or things like even sending a video ahead of time to mm-hmm. maybe some other parents or friends that say, oh, you smashed it. I'm so proud of you. I heard you did really, really well. <laughs> can't wait to see you this evening. I think there's many little moments in the day and in the week and in the year that you just make sure that your children are really loved. And also that they start to understand that you can't be there for everything. Because yeah. sadly, that's the reality of parenting yeah. in this modern day. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's another thing I feel like with those boundaries. And sometimes when work is chaotic, it's really difficult not to bring that mm. home with you. So are there things that you put in place that are kind of like, that is work and this is life? So the blend it doesn't blend in, yeah. it doesn't seep in. I have to be really honest. I'm struggling with this one. Really, really. <laughs> I feel like, let's just be honest, yeah, right? Yeah, I find yeah, it yeah. really hard, especially I think when they were younger. Um, I had a, an amazing sleep consultant <laughs> who, you know, helped me gain my confidence with putting them down to sleep. You know, seven o'clock, they'd be sleeping. Yeah. They can't talk. They can't move. Yeah, Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I could crack on with what I needed to do. And yeah. now they're older and they're more active and it's, you know, daylight saving. And they stay up later. And they stay yeah, up yeah. later. I find myself sometimes when it's really busy being like, just go to bed. Mm-hmm. So 
much to do. Mm -hmm. There is always something in the back of my head that says, you're not going to get this time back. You're not going to get this time back. Just relax. But the advice I would give, Mm. I don't take myself. Okay, that's fine. (laughs) I'm I'm here for this. Yes. (laughs) Is when you're thinking about your boundaries is to define what's urgent. Because you're urgent and someone else is urgent might be very different. Mm -hmm. And so if it's really urgent to someone else, they'll be like, quick, it's urgent. I need you to, you know, get online or send this email or deal with this client. But actually, if you've agreed ahead of time at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the quarter, if these things happen, then yes, you can call me or you can reach out to me because it's we've agreed that it's urgent. If these things don't happen, it's not urgent and I'm not picking it up until I am ready mm-hmm. to do so. So I think it's it's having the courage to have those conversations. And if you are listening and you're a leader in any organization, I think lead from the lead from the top. Yeah. I used to work with an amazing, amazing boss who and she had kids herself. It was very clear when she was going to respond to something out of hours and when and when she when she wasn't. So then you know, as somebody was working into her, you then felt empowered that actually, no, this is this is my family time yeah. and this is how I'm going to handle it. And actually, I'm not going to let the two blend when they don't need to blend. Final question that you almost asked is how do you have the conversation about promotion coming back from maternity leave as a working parent? Really good question. I think it's possible. And the reason why I love that people ask me this question is I think lots of people feel like actually you've got to put your career progression on hold because yeah. you have had a child or you've had any kind of career break and you don't necessarily, because all that career capital hasn't disappeared. You still held a lot of value to that organisation or that job or that or that skill set. Um, so I recommend people if possible to get a sponsor so a mentor and a sponsor are two really different things so a mentor is somebody who's maybe walked down the road that you want to walk from a career perspective and can help advise you a sponsor can do the same things a mentor can do but the difference is a sponsor is somebody who's usually really high up and quite senior in an organization that has the ability to you know hire and promote and make those really big decisions Mm -hmm. the reason why i think a sponsor is really important and if you can get a sponsor before you go on maternity leave or a career break even better yeah because in those moments where normally you'd be having kind of annual reviews or conversations about you know progression and promotion if you were there hopefully you'd be saying i i think i'm really ready for this promotion and these are the reasons why but when you're on maternity leave you can't do that because you're not physically present the great thing about a sponsor and what I really encourage people to do is, you know, write down your your skills and your achievements and everything you've done and have that conversation with that sponsor and say, look, this is what I've done. This is my goal. This is why I think I'd add a lot of value in that um, position to this organisation. I'm going on this career break or I'm going on maternity leave. And so if an opportunity like that comes up, I want you as my sponsor to throw my hat into the ring and there's been loads of research that's been done and there's a brilliant organization that's um it's called catalyst um and it basically shows that when a woman particularly has a sponsor they're more likely to get promoted and even more so if you are going on maternity leave you're just about to come back Mm -hmm. i think we're, we're humble by nature especially when you're kind of coming back from maternity leave you think oh my goodness i'm so lucky to have a job to come back to and that's the thing isn't it being thankful you must want to don't don't want to seem ungrateful Grateful, yeah it's like the sticky floor. It's like this this gratitude sticks us to, to where we're at, even though we've got the, the capability and the ability and the skill set to go further than mm-hmm. that. And we would add so much more value if we allowed ourselves to just say, do you know what? I really think I'm going to be really good at this thing and I've got a lot to offer. I'd love to put my hand into the ring or I'd love to have a conversation about what it's going to take to get there. I think that's the first step is just not yeah. hiding your goals, yeah. and then if you can, really get that sponsor. And if you can't get that sponsor, get a mentor, get somebody who has done it to help advise you and kind of coach you on the way. Uh, so we asked uh, the Happy Mum, Happy Baby community to send in some questions. So we've got a few for you. Uh, someone has, has said, when my twins are ill, I'm having to take unpaid leave, but still paying for nursery puts us in the red each month. Mm, Help. Gosh. That's a massive thing, isn't it? Like It's that, it's those unpredictabilities within in parenting. It's hard. I don't know what situation this person is in. Yeah. If they are in a relationship, I often talk about not being the childcare martyr. Right. So not being the person that says automatically when the child sick, like, I'll do it, I'll go there, nursery calls you first. Mm-hmm. You know, have that conversation with your partner saying, right, 
we've got this scenario here that it's happening. Like, how are we going to make it work? Are we going to take it in turns? Are we going to take it, yeah. you know, this quarter you take it, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the worst thing to do is kind of go into that automatic assumption that necessarily the, the mum is, is going to pick it up. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, I would say that, I hope that these nursery bugs, they do pass as these children, that as they build their immunity. So sometimes it just feels like a really rough season mm -hmm. and sometimes it, you've just kind of got to go through it. And I, I appreciate that financially it's kind of putting you out of out of po pocket. But if it is happening for an extended season, I would, I would my sister's a GP, I would say, <laughs> you know, go, go and see or go and see your GP, for example. It yeah. could be something that might be might be resolved with a bit yeah. of treatment. So if it, it if it is kind of prolonged, I would say, you know, don't don't put up with it in that sense. But yeah. definitely have that conversation with it could be a partner, it could be friends, it could be community, for example. Um and yeah, and just see if you can get any help. Again, there are some organizations, they're much bigger organizations though, yeah. so not every organization offers this. There are some organizations that actually offer emergency nannies. So maybe have a have a have a wow. think, speak to other people yeah. in your workplace, see how they deal with it. Because it's really hard. I um, do I, I love what you said about it not always falling on the mum. You know, if it's a if it's a two parent household, knowing that it's not one person that's always you know, not going to work that day or having to, you know, stay at home. The fact that it's shared. I think that with WhatsApp groups, yeah. when it comes to class WhatsApp groups, whether it's going to the whatever meetings that are on, I feel like actually both parents within the household should know what's going on and feel that Absolutely. way equally. Absolutely. And if you're, put, you know, writing your next of kin telephone numbers on, on that form, have a think about writing your partner's name first. <laughs> You know, I know lots of people that do that and the nursery still call the mum. Um, but yeah, you know, have, th have that conversation. I think it's most important to have that conversation rather than to not have it. Yes, absolutely. Um, next person has said, my flexi work request just got denied. I meant to go back from maternity leave in five weeks and don't have childcare. What oh, should I do? Oh, no, you just know so those five tough. weeks just feel like they're going to disappear so quickly okay. as well. Yeah. I think the really interesting thing with kind of denying of flexible working or or any kind of conversations, I like to see them as a bit of a negotiation. Yeah. Negotiations don't always have to be hostile. Negotiations, I believe everybody should walk around, walk away with some kind of, you know, win-win scenario as yeah. much as possible. So I find with objections, you really need to get to the root of why they have said no. Again, I, it's quite hard to, you know, give advice yeah. without the details. Um, and the funny thing about objections in human beings is that the first time they, you ask why and they give you their objection, it very often isn't the real reason. Really? Yeah. So you need to kind of politely provoke and say, okay, oh, but why is that? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Okay, tell me more about that. And why is that? And often I find when you politely question and you politely provoke, you get to the real objection. Right. And then once you know the real objection, you can start to think about different counter scenarios or, or counter objections. Yeah. Um, it's quite tricky. And I would say with flexible working, you, you need to go in with a couple of scenarios that could work for you. I think where negotiations or conversations can feel quite standoffish is that where you've got this one thing that you want and the other party's got this one thing that they're not budging on and mm -hmm. therefore there's just no manoeuvre room, there's no wiggle room and everybody walks away feeling a bit frustrated. Yeah. So is there a B option or a C option that could potentially work for you and that you, once you understand what their real objection is, you know, you can start to play around with those alternative options that could potentially potentially work. So hard, isn't it? Because you can almost see how something like wanting flexible flexible working or not quite knowing what you want can really hang over you yeah. in your maternity leave. And actually the reality is you can put things in place when you are pregnant, mm. but you don't know how you're going to feel the other side of it. You don't know what your family's going to look like and how that's going to feel when you're actually about to go back to work. So there has to be some maneuverability between yeah. you and your workplace to kind of see where where everyone is at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I you know, I think a, a good employer would be having those conversations. You know, yeah. when you're ready to have that conversation, how are you feeling about coming back? What support do you need? 
when you when you come back because it's really important that you know I fundamentally think it's important that again women have the option mm. to come back into the workplace we're very valuable we're very valuable to the economy as well um you know when we are when we are working and I think actually as an employer actually making sure that those people have a smooth return process will pay dividends in the long run yeah so you know it really is worth having those conversations again if you are you know managerial positions and you do have people coming going away on career break you know, make the point where you can and if you, if it's agreed and accepted to kind of get in contact with people um, or, or as the point that they're returning, yeah, make the point of just finding out how, how they're doing and, yeah. you know, what support do they need to, to be effective in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, final question is, how can I get my husband to understand how much I do and appreciate all that I do with juggling work and motherhood? That's so tricky, isn't it? Because there is, like you were saying earlier, there's that just preconceived notion, that idea that that is the the woman's load, yeah. that's the mother load. Yeah. And actually, if women are out working as long as men, you know, it's it's that's such an outdated idea. Yeah. Like we we can't we simply cannot function in that way. No, we can't. It's, it's really hard as well because I think in these conversations, it's so easy to slip in to well, I'm doing this yeah. you're not doing that and you're doing this and and I think those conversations I know them well <laughs> I, think those, I think those conversations become not that productive yeah. so sometimes it could be actually just sitting down and planning your week together and mm-hmm. getting a calendar out could be the old-fashioned way with pen and paper and kind of just going through right what have we both got on this week what do the children have on this week what is it going to take for those kids to get to where they need to yeah. to be and do everything they need they need to do this week, right? They, you know, we had board game day, so we had to make sure we had all the board games and pack them up to school and stuff like that. So actually, writing those things out together mm-hmm. and having that conversation of right, okay, right, can you do this? Okay, right, I'll I'll do that. That feels like a fair blend of responsibilities. Yeah. I think that's maybe one way to tackle it. He could read the blend <laughs> if he wants to, you know, to start again, to start to understand. I think that journey of, you know, what do we go through? All the different things that we have to consider just to get to our laptops by 9 a.m. or mm-hmm. 9.30 a.m. You know, there's, there's quite there's quite a bit. Lots of this actually starts from before the child comes along and having those continuous conversations about, right, how are we going to make this work between the two of us because it's not just about you know one person and I think that can build a lot of resentment in relationships as well that's the thing isn't it it's the resentment that builds and then all of a sudden it's such a massive thing and you can't talk about it yeah all you're going to do is actually just be quite passively aggressive (laughs) towards each other you know and not doing anything in a in a in a respectful way yeah absolutely and it's really hard and I think sometimes even looking at through the lens of your your kids and thinking, okay, what example do you want them yeah. want them to see? Like my husband's amazing at cleaning. I mean, I can clean, but <laughs> he's got <laughs> superpowers in that area. <laughs> so, yeah. so you know, we have that conversation about right, who's going to going to divvy up the responsibilities? And I think it's you know, not being held by traditional roles because yeah. I think they're fast going out the window. The roles that we play in our household are determined by what we need mm. more than what society says we should do. Um, if, if you know, a mum comes to you at my bump pay, how do you want them to leave you feeling? Encouraged. Yeah. Hopeful. Less alone. I want them to feel like, actually, it's not easy, for sure. Some Maybe some people find it super easy. I haven't met many women that find it really easy. But yes, it's not easy. But in some way, shape or form, enjoying this journey, whether you're leaning into your career or, or not, or you're leaning into your career at home, enjoying it is something that you're able to do and not yeah. feel like, right, you've given up whatever hopes and dreams that you had because of your life stage or because of your family. So I just, yeah, I want people to feel the joy. I want them to feel the spark and I want them to feel encouraged. Yeah. And not feeling like, you know, like they're missing out or they've failed if they're good, cho- choosing a different path or maybe what they set out. Exactly. Beforehand. Yeah. We end the podcast with you completing three sentences. Mm-hmm. The first one is being a parent means. Oh, being a parent means being my best self for my kids. Mm. If I could tell you one thing, it would be. If I could tell you one thing, it would be, I think I'm really good at lots of things. And one of those things is parenting and one of those things is work. Oh, and I'm happy when. Oh, I'm happy when I'm dancing in the living room to Beyonce with my kids. (laughs) 
<laughs> passing on great musical taste. I love it. I highly approve. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's such a massive topic. And, you know, I feel like in many ways we've, we've touched on things, but you know if, if you listen to this and, and just feel like oh, I need I need more or you're feeling a little bit lost or you just know that you need support go and find Toby mm. because she's brilliant oh thank you so and much and read the blend yeah. <laughs>